Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Todd Quinn's SharePoint podcast number 253, recorded live on July 13th, 2005, uh, perhaps the sunniest, hottest day in Iowa history, uh, but I made it. I'm here. I'm your host. I'm Todd Clint. I went out today. I went out. The The glowing orb in the sky did not burst me into flames. Uh, I was able to escape with my life, so I got that going for me. And I, and I would have missed. I would have been, felt horrible if I would have missed it all. Uh, missed you guys tonight. But I'm here. I'm your host. Um, and while uh, while we're here, let's talk about my friends at Rackspace. Uh, so I work on the, uh, the SharePoint team. You can go to sharepoint.rackspace.com. And find out about all the great SharePoint things we do, but stay tuned because I'm going to talk about some other non SharePoint things that Rackspace does. You're not going to want to miss this. I've even got a special guest sneaking in tonight to talk about some of that. So uh, stay tuned for that. Tonight's going to be a short one. It's a it's a sunny, beautiful summer evening out. We've all got better things to do. Uh, go outside and play or whatever. Hopefully, those of you that listen to this on your commute in, you have a sunny commute and that's faster and that's gonna that's gonna be better for you. But tonight's is. Uh, probably going to be a little uh, a little short but let's um let's move on to the production notes so joanne klein uh, is saying you picked the hottest day of the year to run wow so joanne it's been a couple of months since you've seen me i think ignite uh i am not a skinny guy and so i um i like to make myself run every time i talk myself into running <laughs> so today uh, I, w- I decided i was going to run and uh, so I did. Didn't run very far. Clearly didn't die. But that's just kind of kind of drive that I have. Uh, so on to production notes. And actually, let me scoot this over. Oh, there we go. So, oh, now I've done it. <laughs> I scooted it over, and I think I unplugged it. There we go. Uh, I didn't want it to say. Uh, reduction notes uh so last week's show was the one with kirk evans and uh it was great it was uh we had a lot of fun so if you haven't downloaded podcast 252 stop what you're doing right now uh well if you're in your car don't stop your car but stop the podcast and go to your podcasting app and download uh podcast 252 it's one of the Kirk Evans. You can find it at toddclinton.com slash podcast 252 or on my YouTube channel. Um, any of the things, the Todd Clinton netcast, any of those uh, places. But it was a great one. We had um, Kirk Evans on. He's a buddy of mine. He works at Microsoft. He works on the Azure team. And he and I talked uh, for a good long time, uh, for, for uh, the podcast was over an hour, about Azure, Active Directory, and Office 365, and all the great things that are going on uh, in the Azure thing. So I learned a bunch. Kirk's a great guy. And I had a lot of a lot of great comments about it on Twitter. A lot of people asking for me to bring Kirk back. A lot of people asking for me to just step away and let Kirk run the show. Uh, Kirk, I know my mom listens to the podcast. I didn't realize that your mom listened to the podcast as well. Uh, but it was uh, it was a great podcast. Learned a lot. So by all means, download that one and uh, and we, we got that going. Now, last week's podcast went off really well. This week, uh, my executive producer. Or senior executive producer, I forget what her title is now, and a web master, mistress, mayhem, whatever. Uh, Lori is gone this week. She's uh, on vacation, a well deserved vacation. And so I'm running the show uh, completely by myself. I can only imagine that something's going to happen, like I'm not actually going to record it or, or something hysterical like that. Uh, but that's, uh, I'm doing the best that I can. And it's funny because Lori volunteered to start helping with the production stuff. Uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I forget how long it's, uh, it's been going on. And before that I did it all by myself. <laughs> and now the idea of doing it all by myself, I'm like, Oh my God, I can't remember how to do everything. How do I update the web page again? Oh my God. Uh, it's tough to believe that I ever did do this thing all by myself, but, uh, but Lori's gone. It's great. Um, and I wanted to make sure that, uh, she, you know, she got a shout out, even though she's on vacation, we'll do, uh, We'll do the best that we can. Um, and so part of the thing that's uh, goofy right now is I got my notes in the wrong order. So after I talked about the uh, the podcast that I had with Kirk, I was going to remind you guys that you can get transcripts for all of my podcasts from CMS Wire. So those folks have been kind enough to offer text transcripts of, of my podcast every week. And this was a thing, I talked about this a little bit when this first started, but when me and some buddies were out having lunch one day and I got some tech buddies here in Ames and one of them was saying, you should do a a transcript of your podcast. I'm like, 
that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. That is terrible. Well, so at that time, we were at a restaurant that served tater tots, and one of the guys at the table did not get tater tots. That was the dumbest idea I'd ever heard was not getting tater tots when tater tots were available. But the second dumbest idea I'd heard was having a transcript for my podcast. I'm like, there's no value in that. Who who would want that? That just doesn't make any sense. And he's like, have you ever gone to a web page, you know, saw a link and gone to a web page to get some information about something? And then you get there and all it is is a dumb video. And I'm like, oh my God, I hate that. I wish there would just be, oh, text, son of a gun. So, um, so Matt, uh, Matt remind, you know, gave me that idea. And then I just wasn't sure how I was going to execute on it. The uh, the guys over at the, uh, the Microsoft Cloud Show, Chris Johnson and Andrew Connell, both of whom we always call by their initials, uh, AC and CJ. Well, CJ and AC, but you get the deal. Um, they have a transcription thing. So I talked to them a little bit how they, about how they do it. But then completely randomly, completely coincidentally, the folks at CMS Wire uh, got a hold of me. They said, hey, we, we're big fans of your podcast. They're, I appreciate the lie, but uh, they're like, hey, it's really great. They just, they, they couldn't, they couldn't lie enough. Um, and they said, Hey, we would love to make this a, uh, a transcript. We would love to make articles out of it. And so they, they do that. So now every uh, Monday I do the podcast, I render it out as an audio file Tuesday morning. I ship it to them. They do the transcription. And then Thursday, when I publish this, they publish an article on CMS wire. So you can go to cmswire.com slash author slash Todd dash Clint, and you can get the transcripts for this. They make a great uh, companion to the audio and it's got all the links and all that kind of stuff in it. So that's, that's great of them. I appreciate that. That sounds like horrible work and I, I feel terrible for the people that have to do it, but it was all their idea. It was not, it was not my fault. It was all their idea. Um, so that, uh, that's a great compliment to this because, uh, you know, you just, sometimes you always don't want to sit through the video. The other thing, for those of you who listen to the audio, which is like 90% of my audience. Uh, this is also on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com slash Todd Clint netcast and all of my netcasts are there. The great thing about that is if you go to the YouTube video in the notes for the YouTube video, I have all the times and you can click the time and jump right to the topic you want to hear about. So you don't have to suffer through the entire podcast. Amen for that, right? That's just horrible. So all this crap that I'm doing now, you can just skip all that and jump to the stuff that you uh, that you actually care about. So that's a great uh, trick that I learned from uh, from a friend of mine, and that's a good one. So you can just click the time signature and go right to, right to where you want to. Uh, more production notes. Uh, the tentative plan. I've been talking about this. It seems like forever, but the tentative plan to move the podcast time is Monday, August third. So in theory, Monday, August 3rd will be the first podcast that I will do at 3.30 in the afternoon central. Now, the reason that I'm moving this is because I've been having more guests on. Tonight, I'm going to have another guest. And I've got some guests that I want to have on from uh, from Europe. And the time right now for those of uh, for those folks that are in Europe, in London, it's like uh, 1.45, 2.45 in the morning, something like that. And it just gets worse the farther uh, the farther east you get in Europe, and so I kind of wanted to do that. And also, you know, it's it's tough. Some people can can watch this thing during home hours, and some people can't. And so I'm going to try three thirty in the afternoon um, uh, for a while. So that'll be three thirty central. It'll be five hours earlier than it is now. Now, for those of you that don't watch it live, you're not going to be impacted. It's still gonna, probably going to come out on Thursdays. Those of you that watch it live. Um, We'll be able to <laughs> Mark Christman in the chat room. Mark is hardcore. Mark is in the Eastern time zone. He's in New York. So it's almost almost 10 o'clock, almost bedtime for him. And he's like, hooray, I get to go to bed at a reasonable time on Mondays now. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, that. And and uh, Ryan Yates. So Ryan Yates is in the UK. It's 2.45 a.m. There is no way I would stay up for this at 2.45 yeah, but we're going to try that. Now, I know that'll hurt some folks that can't watch it at work, and I apologize for that. But we'll try it for a while and, and see how well it works. Um, final production note is I've been talking to some other people that have guests, and I have a big, a fairly big name that's uh, that's looking to come on. Now, that's not to say that I haven't had some big names before. I've had Bill Bear, uh, I had Mark Manassi on there, and I'm just name dropping now. I'm just trying to look cool. Uh, but uh, I got a couple other people lined up to bring on. And uh, so w- once I get those those nailed down, I'll I'll let you guys know, but hopefully here in the next month or two, we'll have, uh, uh, have some cool new guests on and I'll, I'll make sure and mention all that. Okay. Let me change my tag thing over here. 
Bloop. Oh, the other production note that I wanted to mention was I went for a run at, at noon and I didn't put gel back in my hair. So my hair is all fuzzy and uh, I'm growing my summer beard right now. So it's about a week of growth here. I think it's coming in nice. I'm looking. I didn't, uh, I didn't mean to turn y'all on with the beard thing. It's completely accidental. Didn't mean to do that. All right. So today uh, was the Worldwide Partner Conference in Orlando. I know there's about half of Rackspace, about everybody I work with. Uh, at rack spaces down in Orlando party and for the worldwide partner conference, a whole bunch of things that came out of that. And I don't, um, I don't know all the stuff to cover. I'm not going to cover a bunch of it because I was busy today. I didn't get a chance to read on it, but a whole bunch of things came out. They showed some new, uh, HoloLens demos that were just amazing, like augmented reality stuff. They, uh, Showed some new products, Gig Jam, and a couple other things. And I'll get some more in-depth stuff in, in later podcasts about that. But one of the things they talked about a lot was Windows 10, a little bit. And so I had some Windows 10 topics that I wanted to start things out with. Because as you guys know, I've been hitting Windows 10 pretty hard for the last few months. And uh, so I had some some fun adventures with Windows 10. So I've got, as you guys know, an unhealthy addiction to little tablets. Within arm's reach of me right now, I believe there are five working tablets with a screen size of eight inches or larger or eight inches or smaller. One, two, three, four, yep. Five just on my desk, just right here. There's another one over there. There's a couple more upstairs. Uh, so I've got an addiction. I'm talking to some medical professionals about it. We're seeing what we can do, but, uh, but I've, I've got a problem, but, uh, through all the windows 10 builds and I've been running windows 10 on a couple of boxes for a long time, they've never really been good for tablets. And so I haven't put Windows 10 on any of my tablets. Well, build uh, 10,166 came out last week and I got it on a couple of boxes and Windows 10 for the longest time has had a tablet mode, which was nice because one of the problems with Windows 8 was that it was all for tablets. So you had to start screen and then Windows 8.1 came out and they added a bunch of desktop stuff, but everybody was still mad. So they're like, with Windows 10, we're gonna make this better for the desktops, which was terrible because Windows 8.1 was awesome for tablets very finger friendly. I'll leave those jokes uh, behind. So I've, I've uh, resisted putting Windows 10 on these tablets because they haven't been quite as uh, tablet friendly, but 10,162 and 10,166 were in pretty good shape for that. So I started putting it on some tablets uh, this last week and had varying degrees of success. Now, one thing that made me feel better about it was uh, my, my friend Paul Therott, who does the Windows Weekly podcast, and he also blogs at uh, therott.com. He was trying to do the same thing at the same time and having very similar problems. And so I felt a little better about uh, getting my butt kicked by that. But uh, so I had some things that I wanted to talk about in, in regards to that. So the first thing that I had was all these tablets, and of course, they're all dead now and been suffering but like this little wind book here this was 70 bucks or whatever when i got it they don't have any kind of optical drives or anything so in order to install windows and i didn't want to upgrade i couldn't upgrade this one because this one was using wim boot so wim boot was a windows 8 one only i believe feature that it was ingenious and i loved it it would allow devices like this this has got uh 16 gig of storage on it i believe and it allowed you to install windows on this and what it did was it created that part that recovery partition that all windows boxes have it's the one that if you want, want to make a recovery drive it uh you know creates your media from that but it allows the box to boot off of that recovery information which is great it's a brilliant idea but the problem becomes that they don't upgrade very well now windows 10 tried to upgrade i tried that route first and it's kind of clever how they do it except for the fact that it didn't work <laughs> But that's the joy of using previews. Um, so I tried to do the Windows uh, 10, you know, the Insider program, blah, 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 sign this all up, and then try to do the upgrade. And the upgrade would start and reboot and all that. And it would say, uh, we need more room to upgrade. We don't have enough space. We need, we need more room, which is, which is brilliant. And then there was a drop down, and you could pick removable drives for it to do all its temp stuff with. So I assume what it was going to do was copy stuff out, resize the partitions, and then upgrade Windows 8.1 uh, to Windows 10 on the device. And it would try. Oh, Lord, did it try. And this is a box with 16 gig of, uh, of storage and 2 gig of RAM and a crappy uh, Atom uh, Z3735 processor. Um, uh, and so it went, 
uh, pretty slow, but it would it would do all that, and I and I used a uh, a thumb drive so I could see it flash and I could see it trying, but it uh, but it just couldn't couldn't pull that off. So then my next um, my next thought was okay, I will do a clean install and see how that works, and that w- worked a little better, though I, I had to fight with it some because now I had to boot from media, and that's where things got ugly. Um, so I went out and did some looking and you've been able to create USB boot media since windows seven. And that was one of the crazy things, uh, cause I'm a, just a big nerd when the windows seven preview started coming out, however many years ago that was, I told myself that I was never going to burn windows to physical media again. I was never going to install windows from a CD or a DVD. So to that end, again, cause I'm a big nerd. I have Windows uh, deployment services installed on a server next door. My basement's over there. Uh, so I have Windows deployment services installed. So if I've got a machine that can boot off of the, excuse me, boot off of the network, I can install Windows from my network without media. And then the other thing that I do is use USB drives. And I didn't want to fuss with trying to boot one of these tablets off the network and use WDS and create the installation point for that. So I decided to create a USB boot media drive. And the directions for that have been out forever. Microsoft actually has a tool that creates those, and it works for Windows 8 and Windows 10 and all that. But it didn't work for me. Uh, I couldn't get this device, this WinBook, to boot off of my media. Now, this tablet has a, a unique feature in that it has a full-size USB port. So most of these little tablets just have one USB port for charging and for guest USB devices, and it's called a USB OTG or on-the-go port. And that gets a little weird, a little hinky, but I've had pretty good luck with it. But I couldn't get this thing to boot off of my media. So I tried, you know, doing it again and it didn't work. So it turns out this tablet and most new devices these days don't use BIOS the way that we're used to. They use a thing called uh, EUFI, UUFI, UFI, I don't know how you pronounce that, but it stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. So it's kind of the new version of BIOS. And in order for that to boot correctly, I had to have a, a GPT partition, not a bash, ma- master boot record partition. And the file system on the drive had to be FAT32. And so I was using a tool called Rufus, and there's a link to a windowscentral.com uh, article in the chat room, and I'll put it in the notes, that shows how to use Rufus to create these media. It's super simple. You say, here's the USB drive, uh, here's the ISO file, make with the booting, and it does it. But the defaults for this weren't working, so I had to go through several uh, combinations of tests to make it work. But when I hard-coded GPT and hard-coded FAT32, then it would boot. And I was able to boot my tablet to my Windows 10 installation thing and install Windows 10 on this tablet. Um, So a clean install was the only way that I could go. And it went very, very, very slow, (laughs) very slowly. And when I got done, I had Windows 10 on the tablet, but a bunch of things didn't work. And for whatever reason, I can't get a bunch of the drivers to work. So for instance, the touchscreen doesn't work, which on a tablet is kind of the kiss of death. So I've been using my little... uh, gyroscopic mouse and all this. I had that plugged in. That was another thing. I, I had the USB drive in there and I booted to it to install Windows 10 and it booted up, but the touchscreen wasn't working so I couldn't actually do anything. So I ended up having to use a USB hub and hook a keyboard and a mouse up to it, but that worked. Booted to the USB drive, you could use the keyboard, got it set up, got some drivers that won't work. So I don't know, this one might end up getting scrapped and, and reinstalled later. But uh, so I did get that working. Paul Thorat. Uh, has an article about what the upgrade process looks like, and it shows the uh, you know the, the drop down that tells you where your size stuff is. The funny thing about that is, at the same time I was trying to do this, Paul was also trying to upgrade his WinBook, having the same terrible luck that I had with the upgrade. So I talked him into trying to do a fresh install, and I last I checked, he had not gotten that to work either. Now that might be because he's a busier guy than I am and just hasn't had the time yet, but I've we've been trading emails about that. I sent him my instructions and I don't think it worked. Oh, so that's, and I got to get him another shout out. So uh, Jared Shockley's in the, the, the chat room. I was talking to Jared last week on the phone and he was talking about this and doing some stuff. And he reminded me of another trick that I wanted to talk to you guys about. So the Wimboot stuff that works in Windows 8.1 is taken out for Windows 10. So they had some problems with that, which is too bad because, again, it was pretty clever uh, with the way it booted off of that. 
So what they have done now with Windows 10 is they've got this idea of a compact install for these kind of devices. And then the compact install is a combination of not installing as many things and using file level compression to save space on the disk and that kind of stuff. But for whatever reason, the Windows 10 installer doesn't default to that automatically. It doesn't say, hey, this drive is smaller than 32 gig and do this automatically. At least I don't, it didn't look like it did. So you have to kick off the setup with a parameter. But if you're doing a fresh install, there's no place to put that in. So when Jared and I were talking, he reminded me of this. And so with this boot thing, it got a little clumsy. And I'm sure, I think Jared probably had to do it too. So since this tablet had this uh, UFI interface, I couldn't just like mash on F8 or whatever to boot from my USB device. So Windows 8.1 was running and I went in and I typed uh, boot and it said, you know, boot up options. And then it says, how do you want to boot up? And I said, I want to do an advanced boot and the machine reboots. And then it comes up and it says, hey, what do you want to boot off of? You know, internal drive, USB drive, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, USB, click, USB hard drive, click. Um, and then it boots up off the USB drive once you get it set up correctly. And then it comes up and says, Hey, do you want to install windows? But it was trying to do an upgrade and I needed to, uh, well, I was trying to do install, but I needed to, to pass it this compact parameter to do this compact install. So instead of installing windows, I told it I wanted to repair windows. And this is where it gets crazy. Um, uh, it brings you back to that boot page. It says, what do you want to boot off of? USB, whatever. But at that point, if you hit Shift F10, you get a command prompt. Now, if you hit Shift F10 the first time, you get the command prompt, but the Windows install is still running in the background. <laughs> so if you try to run setup slash compact, it just kicks you back to that one. And if you close that instance of the Windows setup, it reboots your box. So you have to uh, boot there, tell it you're going to install, then tell you're going to do it a, re a repair and then do the Shift F10 thing. Um, so that was, that was kind of an interesting thing, but I'm sure that once, uh, the media gets out, um, we'll be able to play with that a little bit more because I've got a, a ton of these tablets and I've got one of the broken screen and all that kind of stuff, but that was uh, fun. But, but Paul's got his thing there too. The other thing that, uh, was kind of frustrating. So Microsoft's been marching uh, to, towards getting windows 10 out. Windows 10 is going to be released there. The RTM, the release to manufacturing or the GA, the general availability is the 29th. So that's uh, two weeks from Thursday, whatever. We're coming down the road now. And so because of testing and manufacturing and all that, they're going to be locking down the build of Windows 10 any day now if they haven't already. But uh, the Windows 10 team released a blog post today. that was kind of crazy and kind of uh, uh, disappointing they're suspending all of the Windows Insider uh, Windows 10 builds now. And what was super frustrating is they blogged it and they said, hey, because we want to have all our people taking time to test this new build and all that, uh, within the next 24 hours, we're going to suspend everything. And what that means was whatever build of Windows 10 you're on, if you go into Windows Update and do a check for updates, that update will show as current. No more updates through Windows Update. They're going to remove the ISO downloads for uh, all of the builds, but more recently, 10.162 uh, and 10.166 can remove the ISOs. And for you cheeky buggers like myself that already had ISOs downloaded, as, in, as I'm reading this post, I'm like, ah, oh, oh, that's okay, I've already got the download. The third thing they're doing is they're removing the activation for all of the pre-release keys. So even if you had an ISO downloaded, and even if you had the key saved locally, if you try to install it, it won't activate. So the frustrating thing about that is when I read that uh, blog post when it came out and I'm like, all right, well, I got this other machine I was thinking about doing. I might as well do it right now. And about 12 seconds later, they actually did all that stuff. So in their defense, they were, they were true. They were honest. It was within 24 hours. It was also within about 24 seconds uh, that all that went away. So at the when you're hearing the sound of my voice, if it's not after July 29th, you probably can't get Windows 10. Uh, right now, which is kind of sad because I'd, I'd worked through a bunch of the issues on this tablet. I was going to try another one and now I can't. So that's kind of frustrating. Um, but there's that. So a lot of Windows 10 stuff. Uh, there was an upgrade for Windows uh, 10 for the phone. I've not been able to get that to go on. I've been getting errors, but uh, hopefully that will sort itself out. That build is starting to come together. Also, uh, the things that frustrated me about Windows Phone 10 are less frustrating. 
One of the things that was interesting in the last week is Microsoft laid off 7,600 employees that were part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Nokia purchase. And so, and I guess it was kind of planned the whole time, but for those of us that have kind of been on the fence about windows phone, it did not bode well for the, the direction of the, of that Microsoft said that was all part of the plan. They've also said that there's going to be some, you know, changes about how Lumia's are going to be uh, sold and, and manufactured. They said they're going to come out with some flagship phones, all that kind of stuff. I don't know. It's uh, it's all kind of scary, but uh, the next couple of weeks will be very interesting. All right. One other thing that I saw tweeted last week, and I don't think this site's new by any means, but I thought it was a good one. It is the PowerShell for Office 365 site. You can go to powershell.office.com and read all about that. There's some great stuff there. This is one of the things that I've been talking about lately. And um, everybody knows I love PowerShell. I love SharePoint. I've been getting beginning to love Office 365 and Azure a little bit too. So it was all uh, pretty obvious that I would find all this stuff to do. I've been doing talks on PowerShell and Office 365. I'm doing one next month at SB TechCon. And so this is a great site. It's got some good resources. It's got some script samples, uh, things like that. So if you're decent with PowerShell and decent with SharePoint, but a little nervous about Windows 365 or Office 365, uh, that's a good place to go. PowerShell.office.com. All right, so we're we're uh, we're winding out. There. I told you that uh, today was when uh, the Worldwide Partner Conference, Rackspace being a uh, big Microsoft partner. Yeah, again, we had a big presence there at uh, WPC. We had a couple of big announcements. So the first one is we are announcing um, Rackspace fanatical support for Office three sixty five. So. Rackspace is a hosting company, and we all know that Rackspace is a hosting company. But Rackspace, we don't like to think of ourselves necessarily um, as a hosting company. We like to think of ourselves as a service company that happens to service hosting things. Our support, our fanatical support is really our differentiator. And fanatical support at Rackspace is drilled into all of us. It starts with the week that you start, uh, Rookio, Rookie Orientation. They talk about what fanatical support is, who the guy is that coined the term, what it meant, why he did it, all that kind of stuff. And every month we have an open book meeting at Rackspace where the, the senior leadership team talks about what's going on and all that kind of stuff. And one racker out of the 6,100 rackers there are now who has gone above and beyond to help a customer, they're uh, awarded the Fanatical Award, and they're actually given a straight jacket because, you know, fanatical means crazy. And that's that's a big coveted thing at Rackspace. I've, I've never gotten it. I probably never will. Uh, but that fanatical award is a big deal that we, we take our support very seriously. But it's always been on Rackspace property. It's always been in our data centers and stuff like that. So today's announcement was kind of uh, a big deal because we are now going to be providing fanatical support, but on Office 365. And uh, so that's kind of a new thing for us. So now if you're, if you're, you know, you've got stuff in Office 365 and you need help setting things up or, or management or, or any kind of governance or all, any of these kind of things, you can uh, get that from us. And Microsoft has a program, uh, the CSP program, which is the Cloud Service Provider Program. We're a part of that. And so there are things that we can do to help customers out that Microsoft lets us do. And it's a, it's a big thing. We kind of trickled it out starting in May, I think, but uh, starting... Uh, today, I think you can get it uh, get it for everything, and that includes Exchange, SharePoint, Skype for Business, OneDrive, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to do so. If you've got Office 365 or thinking about Office 365, not sure what to do with it, you can now get a hold of us, and we will guide you uh, through it. And we also have so we kind of have two things. We've got fanatical support for Office 365, and then we've got uh, Rackspace Managed Services. Um, so there's all kinds of great stuff. You can go to rackspace.com and there's a blog post on it. Uh, link in the chat room, link in the notes and all that. Now, not to be outdone, Rackspace had another uh, little uh, thing up its sleeve. And that is doing uh, fanatical support for Office 365 is pretty impressive and something that's kind of cool. But we didn't stop there. We're also announced today, and this is probably the bigger of the two announcements. We also announced that we're going to be doing fanatical support for Microsoft Azure. 
That's just crazy. So this is just flat out you having stuff someplace else and us supporting it. And I was going to tell you all about it and uh, bore you kind of read through the press release. And it was going to be all kind of monotone. But then I got this amazing offer. So one of my coworkers, Jerry Lacanu, uh, is is on the on the line here with us, and he is a product something or something for the Azure product. And so he's going to jump on and tell us why we should all be super excited about the fanatical support for Azure. Thank you, Todd. I'm super excited to be here um, <clears throat> to talk about Azure, talk about hybrid, and most of all, to talk about hybrid, uh, so, or sorry, fanatical support for the Microsoft Azure and also for the hybrid scenarios. All right. Before you, you jump into it, Jerry, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody, tell them who you are, what you do, how long you've been at Rackspace, what your favorite color is, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Jerry Lucanu, I am a product manager at Rackspace. Product managers kind of equate to those familiar with the program managers at, uh, at Microsoft. Not to the level of Bill Bear, but definitely uh, same role, same title. Um, <clears throat> I've been at Rackspace for nine years now. The, the last four of which have been in the product organization. Uh, initially, I spent time supporting Rackers and then also our customers. So a fanatic myself, I haven't won the jacket, but definitely uh, someone who's lived and breathed fanatical support for the last nine years. Um, favorite color, blue. Um, <laughs> but that's Mine more too. of the side. Yeah. <laughs> so so kind of give, give everybody a, an overview. What is uh, fanatical support for Azure? Fanatical support for Azure allows, really it's about choice. And so it, what it boils down to is that you're able to choose your platform that works best for you, your organization, your application, whatever suits, suits you best. You, you had Kirk Evans uh, on last week and he talked about Azure Active Directory and there's some fantastic things you can do with that. That Azure Active Directory is a choice that you have to make into one platform. It's gonna be an Azure. You can install um, Active Directory on uh, another cloud, you can install it in the Rackspace public cloud, or you can maintain it in a private cloud. But to leverage a lot of the tooling that's specific around the Azure platform, you're going to have to choose that platform. But what Fanatical support for Microsoft Azure allows a customer to do is so they've made the choice of the platform they want, but then they need some help with it. Because even though you and Kirk talked about how easy Azure Active Directory was, there's a lot of other components out there. There's 84 different components to Microsoft Azure, and it's growing. It's complex. It's it's complicated. It's not as easy as they make it look when you, when you see Cortana on stage and and doing the analytics behind the the scenes. It takes some uh, some pieces behind. It. it takes some special talented people to get all that all figured out and pieced together. Well, and the other thing about that, and I think your guys' blog posts. Uh, so the so the other thing is, so I asked uh, Shane. So Shane Young, my my former partner in crime, is on that team now. And he's been working the Azure stuff for a while. And so I reached out to him and I said, hey, do you have any links that uh, that you want to send me that I could talk about this? And he sent me the the official Rackspace uh, stuff that's on what, 0365.rackspace.com or whatever. And then there was about, I swear, 40 different industry magazines, you know, Forbes and all these kind of places about everybody else's, uh, you know, reaction to this. But what I thought, one of the key things as I was reading this was yes, it's easy to use, but since this is cloud-based, it changes constantly. And one of the things that IT departments may not have the luxury of doing is keeping up to speed with everything that's added. You said there's 84 components. They're just gonna keep adding. And so that's something the Rackspace can do. They can stay on top of that. You guys can, and the customers can just do whatever they wanna do. Absolutely, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of components of fanatical support that are pretty boring. But those are the things that we take on that as a uh, as a racker or as a systems engineer or a lead tech for a customer, we handle that. We, we make that part easy so customers can focus in on their core competencies of driving their business, developing their application, targeting their customers and their market, and letting us handle that boring stuff so that it works. And that's probably what, you know, the biggest thing about Fanatical is that it works. You can go to bed at night, you've got the warm, fuzzy feeling that someone is monitoring your servers, someone's there to, to keep track of things. And if something does go bump in the night, there's somebody there to, that's already working on it that can pick up the phone that hasn't been woken up out of their deep sleep and slumber in the middle of the night that's already, you know, hey, I've got this, here's what we're doing, here's what we're doing to remediate this, or... If we've worked with you uh, for some time, we probably architected a solution that has prevented you from experiencing any downtime, and we're just medi mediating any services that maybe need to be brought back up. Yeah, so that re reminds me of one of the days when I was an internal IT guy. I used to sleep pretty soundly, and um, I would get calls 
because that you know there's stuff and i would be so confused i remember one time uh getting a call and the the the, the guy from the operations center was a guy named tom and he's like hey tom, uh, todd it's tom in st louis and i'm like I, I i don't know a tom in st louis i'm sorry he's like no you work with me it's you know emails down i'm like i i, I don't is this a wrong number this is a, and so i ended up having on my phone i had to take <clears throat> The, the support number that the, those calls came in from. And I had to give it the company logo so that when my phone rang, I would see our logo. And that would be the thing that would trip me because I would come up out of my stupor and I couldn't, I couldn't tie my shoes. I couldn't. So it's, that's an important thing that, uh, that these are rackers that are normally awake. Um, but that's the other thing when, when I uh, go out to folks and I talk about why they should have SharePoint hosted with us or anything like that. I always talk to them about what you said you know, the, the company, whatever, you know, Spacely Sprockets, their job is not IT. Their job is making sprockets. And IT is a necessary evil. And so one of the things that I like to talk to about, people about is we will take all of those things that aren't your core competency and we will do those. We'll patch your servers and we'll, you know, do the backups and, and all that kind of stuff. And your IT department can stick to doing things that are good for your business. Writing reports about how much, you know, how much more quickly we could make a widget and make more money or do whatever that, you know, stick to that stuff. We'll do all the boring stuff. You do all the fun stuff. And that's, that's, that resonates with folks. Absolutely. And something else really to key off of is something that Rackspace does that the other cloud providers don't really do and they rely on the companies themselves to do is the hybrid model. Rackspace now has our own public cloud. We support the Azure public cloud. And as well, we have our own data center. So on top of the 19 data center regions that are that you have with Azure, you've got n nine other on-premises data centers around the world to, to run your applications if you have a uh, application that has a um, requirement around... Um, uh, persistence. Persistence is, isn't always a great workload for, for cloud. Uh, so you want to be able to run that workload in a persistent environment. So you want SQL running performant. You can run it performant up in the, the Microsoft Azure cloud, but how much is it going to cost you versus running that on-premise and having a hybrid connection or an Azure Express route up into an Azure data center that allows you to have to scale horizontally your, your web app tier or your application tier. Yeah, and the other great thing is, so uh, Joanne Klein, she's in the chat room. Uh, I know Joanne well. She's from Canada. She's uh, up in the Calgary area. And I know that a lot of Canadian companies have requirements around where data is at. Now, Rackspace doesn't have a data center in Canada, so maybe this wasn't a great example. But with Office or with Azure, you know, they move things around. They move workloads a lot around. So maybe it makes sense to have some of your stuff in one of our data centers so you know where it's at, but then some of it in Azure. And, and the different uh, platforms have different strengths. So with this, this relationship now, <laughs> you can have your workload wherever makes the most sense to have it, Azure, Rackspace, wherever. But the great thing is you've got one number to scream at when something goes wrong. You don't have to worry about, is it Microsoft? Is it Rackspace? You just call Rackspace. You scream at us and we make it work. That's absolutely, I mean, you, one person to, the, to scream at or the one I prefer is one throat to choke. Uh, it, it's always great to, you, you've got somebody to go to. Not only do you have to go, or can you go to Rackspace for support, um, architecture, guidance, um, billing questions, it's all handled in one place. So you don't have to go, you don't feel like you're siloed or transferred from department to department. You've got your account manager, your account manager, your account team, you ask them questions and then they're not going to pass you off to somebody else. They're going to answer them for you. Sorry. I've been muting my mic so that, uh, so that the hangouts wouldn't uh, take the video away. <laughs> I got mixed up on whether it was muted or not. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, you know, that's a great thing. And, Nothing against the Azure support, but I feel like Rackspace's uh, support is uh, is pretty good, second to none. So having that uh, having that be the throat to choke is a good one, I guess. Yeah, and you you do have a lot of support options out there. You can obviously go to Microsoft itself, and you can pay nothing and get their their free free support, or you can pay twenty nine dollars for developer support, and it, it scales up. And then there's Premier Services, and there's a model that overlaps between Rackspace. Uh, fanatical support in the Premier Services. Premier Services is obviously a great organization. Uh, it's Microsoft's bread and butter, but obviously we we came together on this, and then they've they've seen that there's a gap that we can fill with this model, uh, and they've selected us to be one of their first partners to be able to sell resell Azure through the uh, CSPA agreement that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, and that's uh, 
that's an, another interesting thing. So, so number one, uh, we've got a super tight uh, relationship with Microsoft. We make them scads of money. And so they've been uh, an integral part of all this work. And so it's not like an us versus them thing. Uh, we're, we're partnering with them. And the other thing, when we tell people that, they're like, oh, 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 we've heard horror stories about partnering with Microsoft. And they, and they have all these terrible stories about, you know, but the problem is that's not been Microsoft for 20 years now. I mean, that's that was uh, and and for good or for bad with the Department of Justice things that happened to Microsoft, uh, you know, at the turn of the century. That's just not the Microsoft story anymore. That's the way things were uh, before. So I, you know, working for a company that's a Microsoft partner, I feel completely satisfied with that. You know, there's a the big worldwide partner expo thing was uh, this week, and and they they take care of their partners now. So that's it's a solid relationship. Absolutely. It, the ecosphere out there is big enough for both of us. Um, we've been competing with Microsoft on certain fronts for quite some time. Um, but at the same time, uh, fanatical support is something that, you know, this is really, if you look at it, it's a, it's a merger, not really a merger, it's a bit bad term, but it's a, uh, it's a coming together of the, one of the world's greatest software and enterprise services companies with the uh, world's greatest uh, support and services company. So it's that merging of, of the two, um, the two spheres that you don't f typically find in one company. Now you can get in one offering from one place. Yeah, and I think the, uh, the the term we usually talk about for that is making the pie bigger. You know, we don't we don't each have to get smaller slices. We can make the pie bigger. Um, yeah, and this is just stacking on twelve plus years. So since thirteen plus years of uh, of Microsoft services uh, offered from Rackspace, and starting in two thousand two when we first started support for the Windows operating system, we started off as a Linux only shop from our founding in nineteen ninety eight up until two thousand two. So four, first four years open source only. Uh, and then we found our way into the, the Microsoft world. And since then, it's been further up, you know, uh, SQL uh, as an application sub, uh, being supported. And then obviously uh, SharePoint, Exchange, uh, now Skype for Business. Uh, we launched that late last year. Um, and then forays into other partner clouds, uh, Google Apps for Business uh, late last year. That was our, our kind of our first foray outside of our data center. Office 365 earlier this year, you mentioned, and they went GA today. So congratulations to my friends over in Cloud Office. Uh, as a former Cloud Office racker, I'm, uh, <laughs> I really do celebrate that victory. And then today, uh, just you know, just another step forward uh, with the fanatical support from Microsoft Azure. Yep, yeah, it's good stuff. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 fun times at Rackspace. There's a lot of uh, a lot of cool things coming. So. I have to wrap this up, uh, Jerry. These folks are nodding off on me. Is there any any part of this that you want to hit again, or any specific message you want to get out before I uh, let you go? Just you know, back again. Microsoft Azure, customer choice, fanatical support. Do you uh, do you have a URL you can throw out for them? Uh, I do. It's rackspace.com/azure. And that'll get you to all of our landing page and our, all of our materials. And if you so choose, uh, get you hooked up with somebody in, in our uh, wonderful sales department that will help you uh, work your way through investigating uh, fanatical support on top of Microsoft Azure, whether you buy it from us or you bring your own subscription. Excellent. Uh, do you have like a Twitter handle or something that people can uh, hit you up at? I, I do. I am uh, at G-L-E-C-A-N-U. That's my first initial and my last name. Uh, Flast, as we like to say. Uh, the old uh, e email handles. Yep. And uh, you can find me out there. Yep. Excellent. And I'll put that in a lower third for you when I do the editing, so it'll all be uh, it'll all be seamless. So thanks for showing up, Jerry. You've been a, a loyal a podcast sufferer for many, many years, and I do appreciate that. Uh, so it's always funny when I'm at work, you know, after the, like the day after I uh, – put these podcasts out, I'll get an email from Jerry like, Hey, that was a great article or Hey, you screw this up dummy and, and all that. So it's, uh, it's been a good time. So, and I'm going to be in San Antonio next week. So I think I will see you, uh, see you down there. Absolutely. I was tempted to start off with the, uh, uh long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> Yo, you, you so should have, that would have been awesome. <laughs> we may make that the show title this week. We'll see. You <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to let you go, Jerry, but uh, thanks for stopping in. Thank you. Uh, so that was good. Um, and, and Jerry, um, and I got to write that one up in my notes. I'm listener. Um, so, so that's, uh, <laughs> so that's good stuff. And, and one of the things that Rackspace has been doing lately is, uh, you know, 
getting our fingers into other people's clouds. And this is a, a really big move for that. I've known this was coming for a while. This has been, been exciting stuff. So thanks to Jerry for showing up. I promise this would be a short one. I absolutely do. I forgot to take that out. <laughs> um, uh, but I will finish up with, uh, with uh, the shameless self-promotion. So in a month now, I will be speaking for the Mississippi PowerShell user group. And they emailed me this weekend about what I'm going to be talking about. And I need to, uh, I need to get a hold of them and let them know. But as soon as I do, I will blog it and let you all know. That is August 11th at 8.30 uh, p.m. Central Time. You can follow along from home if you'd like at mspsug.com. And I'll get more information about that once I get that uh, finished up for them. Then also next month, uh, August 24th through the 27th is SP TechCon. And that is out in Boston. You can find out more about that at sptechcon.com. I'll be speaking about uh, doing some SharePoint upgrades, doing some PowerShell with Office 365 and uh, uh, stuff like that. And then just, you know, there's going to be a rack space uh booth there so i'll be hanging out with those guys and, and all kinds of crazy stuff if you're going to be at sp tech con for goodness sakes come find me hunt me down shake my hand introduce yourself i would love to meet each and every one of you uh there and then the next month is sharepoint alusa down in branson missouri i'm just going to drive down there so if you're going to sharepoint alusa and you're between ames iowa and uh, branson missouri let me know we'll make a road trip out of it it'll be awesome it'll be great um that is september 18th and the 19th not haven't nailed down what we'll be talking about there, but probably identity kind of stuff, uh, Azure type stuff. We'll see what they uh, what they need. And then this is new. I have not talked about this yet. You folks in the chat room are hearing about this first. I also will be speaking at uh, Dev Intersection um, out uh, in Vegas in October uh, October twenty sixth. I'm sure I got that URL right here. Um, so that's uh, that's a new one. Again, haven't. Uh, nailed down exactly what I'm going to be talking about there, but you can find out all about that at devintersection.com. And I will be, uh, I've never, well, I've done, I guess I've never done dev intersection before. So this is, uh, this is my first one. It's going to be the MGM grand. That's October 26th through the 29th. Um, super excited about that. Uh, can't, uh, can't wait to, to go to that one. So I got a busy fall, uh, here. But uh, if you're at any of these conferences and you do see me and you think it's me, for goodness sakes, I'm a super friendly guy. Come up and introduce yourself. Uh, I would love to chat with you. Honestly, I would. So I think we muddled through uh, without Lori, not to say that uh, it won't be 100% better. <laughs> uh, so next week, I am going to be in San Antonio, and I believe you guys will be stuck with Shane. I've tried to do this from the hotel a couple times, and it gets uh, a little dicey. So next week on the 20th, you'll be uh, talking with Shane. He'll probably have more azure things to talk about. We'll see. Uh, but I'll be back the week after that. But thanks, everybody. Uh, had a great crowd tonight. Very active chat room. I appreciate that. If you want to join the chat room, you can go to toddclint.com slash netcast while the uh, podcast is going and uh, jump in the chat room there. So thanks, everybody. Uh, uh, try, to, try to stay cool, and uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Have a good night.